Hey guys, this is Harry with Zero's Geckos. This is vlog number 11. Last week I put up an IG story um, to ask you guys about things not to do in the hobby. I said, thinking about a future vlog about what not to do in the gecko hobby, what are thingy, things you've learned slash seen to, do, to not do? And I put it in my IG story and then I got a few responses. Only 331 people saw this story. A few of you guys have put in some replies, so I'll just kind of rapid fire kind of go through them about, about things that you've learned or seen to not do as people in the hobby, in the community. Preston at Super Yamori said, what not to do, buy without a plan. I agree with that for the most part. And on the Gecko Pod, we say that a lot. At the end of each episode, a lot of the breeders, when we ask them, okay, what would you give some new advice to new breeders? And a lot of them will say, you know, be focused on your projects, buy a couple nice animals rather than spread yourself too thin. And I think there's a lot of truth to that in terms of planning out what you want before you jump in and, and buy. And I can definitely see the value in that. And I agree with that. I also understand the new breeder itch. When you first come into the hobby, you're not sure what you want to do and you begin to pick up things that just kind of catch your eye. And I think to some degree that's okay too as long as you're not blowing budget too crazily. You can pick up things here and there and collect a dozen or so different random animals and grow them out a little bit and you begin to see and notice the things that you like. Because when you are a new breeder, still trying to develop that eye of what you want and quality. You're not gonna know what's quality for a bit of time, right? You can see something that's really expensive and really fancy and you'll think that's quality, but a lot of times it's not necessarily the case. There are a lot of things on Morph Market right now priced at 2,000, 3,000 bucks and they're just low quality animals, but they tag something onto the name of their gecko and they're trying to sell you. And so the price doesn't always equate to value. Instead, you begin to develop an eye for what's good and what's not. Good structure, good patterning, good white patterning, good orange patterning, consistency of how the animal looks, head structure, fringing on the head, scalation, the length of the, the snout, the size and proportion of the animal. And then when it comes to the morph or whatever the animal is, whether it's a tricolor, whether it's an empty back or a high white or a super dal or some quad pinners, you begin to nitpick the quality of that specific morph and those traits and how they pop. So as a new breeder, you're not going to know. And it's common across the board. And it's common that in general, as new breeders, you're not going to have that eye right away. You're gonna think some animals just look nice and eventually you'll develop and find that, okay, there's things that are better. And that takes time. You just look at your animals, figure out what you want, and don't be impulsive in your buying practices. And so when Preston says buying without a plan, I think maybe that's what he means. Like try to develop that eye first in what you want, the taste you want, and the quality, and then you can begin to plan out the diff different projects that you want. Difficulty about that too is that a lot of new breeders don't know how long it takes to develop a project. They think they're gonna buy two animals, put them together, and then that first season they're gonna make amazing things. Not necessarily the case. That can happen, but if you're working at really high-end stuff, it's going to take several generations. Once you understand that, you begin to plan ahead in terms of what you want. You begin to focus more and more on one or two projects rather than spread yourself thin. Because when you're a new breeder, you might think that you can handle a few extra projects, but really it's not the wisest decision when it comes to your space and your time and your energy and money. So I found this out the hard way where even for my high white projects with the amount of space that I have, and I don't have a ton of space, but I feel like I have more animals than the average person, the average breeder. I have about 250 animals or so, and I feel more and more like I need more space for my high white project because it's going to take that long to kind of fine tune the degrees of whiteness that I want, to fine tune kind of the structure and the patterning. And I come to realize that even in Gen 2, 
I need maybe another two generations to really hone in on the animal that I want. Am I going to produce a few animals that I think are amazing? Yeah, and those are holdback quality animals. But a lot of the animals outside of the holdback, they're just, you know, they're okay animals, they're nice animals, but they're not what you're going to pair back into your breeding project. So I guess it's hard to tell exactly how you're going to buy as a new breeder because you don't know all these intangibles of looking ahead and seeing what's going to happen. And so this is why we have these vlogs and the gecko pod to hopefully help you guys to adjust your mindset in not impulse buying, but really hone in first and foremost on what you want. And in order to do that, you just have to look at a lot of pictures, talk to a lot of people and begin to develop an eye for quality. Buy with a plan, yes. But if you're beyond that point and you already bought a ton of animals that you're not sure of, that's okay too, don't freak out. Just grow the things out and see and pick out the things that you like the most, um, sell the rest and work on one or two projects and just go from there. Don't feel bad. I did the same thing. I bought a bunch of stuff in the beginning and I'm not gonna use a majority of it. I begin to sell off things that I'm not gonna use. However, if you're gonna to try to be a big breeder and sell at shows and you want a lot of variety at you know wholesale level or low low to mid tier level then that's fine just collect whatever make whatever and sell whatever at the shows a lot of the shows the local shows I go to it's just that it's just a bunch of animals that are pet quality that are just going to pet homes and that's totally fine so it's just a matter of how you want to run your business and what you want to contribute in the hobby if you're more niche or niche, however you say that, and you wanna hone in and craft a more specific type and vibe of gecko, you need to be a little bit more diligent with buying with a plan and purpose and pairing with a plan and purpose. So thank you, Preston, for that. Caffeinated Cresty says, don't post about, again, what not to do, don't post about needing to sell geckos because of some tragedy and pop up with new one in two weeks. That, all right, so so that's a good one. I feel like that's a pretty good one <laughs> to do. If you're on Instagram long enough, you don't have to be on very long in order to see these posts about, oh, you know, my, I have some hospital bills, some vet bills, I have some car bills, I had an emergency, I need to sell my geckos. Or a lot of people getting out of the hobby saying that they're tired or, you know, they're gonna leave for a little while and I'm selling my entire collection. That happens quite a bit actually. I don't know if that's a marketing ploy to get people to, you know, like look at their stuff and then buy their animals up for cheaper, but really that's just the, the seller trying to dump their stock and then, you know, uh, Caffeinated Cresty says in two weeks they just buy it, come back with new animals. That has happened a good amount of times. They say they're getting out, here's my collection, they dump it and then Two months later, they come back with some Emily Burke animals or some Lily, some fancy Zengex animals or some fancy tricolors. That to me is kind of a shady tactic and um, it rubs people the wrong way. The thing about that though is that people will do this, they'll be forgotten about in a few months and then they'll do it again and again and again. So unless you've been in the hobby long enough to see this pattern, it's kind of hard to tell. And so the people that do this, they get away with it and there are no consequences. You know, some of us, we, you know, we kind of make a list, a mental list maybe of these people and we're like, okay, we're not gonna buy from them again. I've bought into this before. Is it wrong per se? It's not because we're still buying animals at prices that we would have bought at, but I feel like it's just kind of a shady way to operate. It's not wrong to do that, but I feel like that's kind of slimy to do. So don't do that. If you have drama and you have bills to pay, if you have tragedies and you have things that happened. For me personally, I just tend to not say anything because I'm gonna handle my own business anyway. I'm not gonna air out my dirty laundry just for sympathy buys and pity buys. If you do have a tragedy and you do have bills to pay and you post it out, okay, that's fine, but don't go and dump your collection. Use that money to buy another collection. Be a little bit more mindful about your selling tactics and how that looks. Is it any of my business? You know, I can just ignore it. Just don't buy from them, that's fine. But I feel like we have a duty to new breeders to not 
sell them like that, right? We're, they, we're thinking they're getting a good deal and I feel like that's a shady way to low-key scam new breeders, new breeders that don't know any better. They think they're getting a great deal when really it's just you dumping your stock in your wholesale stock so that you can buy new stuff. Meanwhile, new breeders are out with wholesale animals and they don't know what to do with them. So as experienced new breeders, obviously they're not gonna buy into that ploy, but I think it's a shady way to operate because you're essentially low-key scamming new breeders. So new breeders don't buy into people that say like, hey, I have bills to pay or I'm getting out of the, getting out of the hobby, prices are low, buy my stuff. Be hesitant when you look at their stock. They might have good stock. It's possible they might have good stock and they have some animals for sale that are at a good price. But again, ask your friends, ask some trusted, more experienced breeder friends that if things are good deals or what you think about the quality of this versus the price of it. When in doubt, ask breeders that are experienced and breeders that you trust. Thank you for that, Caffeinated Cresties. Armando V8080 um, says, don't waste your time arguing in people's comments over stuff. Yeah, I think that's true too. I think there are a lot of posts that are drama inducing and then people will kind of dive in and kind of stir the pot. Once it gets into personal attacks and once it starts to feel overly negative on both sides, then I feel like that's unnecessary and it begins to cause drama within the community on a public level and I don't think that's helpful. So. Do I think that we shouldn't comment on people's stuff? No, I think we can comment on stuff and we can make little comments here and there about our opinions and thoughts on such an issue that are sometimes touchy, but try to keep it objective. Try to not sharpen your comments in a way that you know is gonna incite drama and bring people in their feels. Just try to have objective conversation and be nice about it. Thanks Armando. Racks by JB, that's John. John says, Again, same as Preston, buy with a purpose and plan for all of the care. Yeah, so answered that along with Preston's Malawi. Malawi Jake, Malawi Exotic 7 says what not to do. Don't get involved in drama. Yes, I, I agree with that. I try to stay out of as much drama as possible. And sometimes I'll get pulled in a little bit, but I just try to keep my distance and... Even though I, I may have strong opinions about certain breeders, certain things that breeders are doing, and even if I disagree wholeheartedly and I have very strong knee-jerk reactions, I'll keep it to myself. You know, I might talk to a couple friends about it, but not with the intention to publicly slander anybody or make anybody feel bad. Instead, I try to keep things in general terms so even these vlogs, I'll talk about the toxicity and the drama oftentimes, but I won't name names and I'll keep it more in terms of general principles of what to do, what not to do. But I agree, Jake, don't get involved in drama. Some people are just so drawn to the drama and they, you know, there are certain characters in the hobby that they're for sure going to dive into this drama and get involved and speak up. I'm not saying we should ignore bad practices and bad stuff, but I think there are ways and tactfulness in how to approach certain issues when it comes to things you don't agree with. But a lot of people often take it way too far. They stir the pot, they incite drama. So again, speak up on stuff, keep it objective. If you have things you need to get off your chest, just talk to your friends about it. <laughs> don't post it publicly when it comes to naming people and shaming people. Again, that's just how I approach things. Other people can disagree and continue to operate the way they do, but I'm just giving you my perspective on how I would handle these things. So thank you, Malawi. Kathy says, learning the different morphs and shipping instructions. Oh, okay, so Kathy, uh, the post was about what not to do, but you want to learn about the different morphs and shipping instructions, which I did in my last vlog, so that's covered. Um, learning the different morphs that one that one yeah I think we can go through that I think I think maybe on one vlog episode maybe I can go through morph market whatever resource has kind of the variations of morphs and how to tell and then I can just kind of talk through that a little bit that might be a good one but yeah thank you Kathy for that okay heirloom geckos Mike what not to do post cringe videos <laughs> make drama be negative 
post political thoughts. Okay, yeah, that's that's true, Mike. Don't post cringe videos. Cringe videos is actually pretty subjective. Some cringy videos that I think are cringy, other people won't think it's cringy. I mean, unless I have an example to pull up and show cringy videos, I think it's hard to say what's cringy and what's not. But there's a good amount of cringe on the internet. But just be mindful of the things you're posting. Um, how I think about it is this. Not just does it draw attention and views and comments because some people like to bait people to comment and view and it, it drums up a lot of publicity, right? Even negative publicity is publicity. And I feel like it's a lazy way for you to gain subscribers. That's just my thought, that's just my comment. You can have a different opinion and, and that's okay. But I feel like posting negativity, posting cringe videos, it's not how I would do it. I feel like I want to post videos that are more just kind of clean cut, more, I don't know, maybe you can call it vanilla, but I feel like clean post, nice looking post will always draw my attention. But yeah, I, I agree with Mike here and also Malawi who just said, don't dive into the drama. Don't make drama. Don't be negative, says Mike. Uh, don't post political thoughts. Stay positive in your posts. Stay objective. Stay professional to some degree of, yeah, being personable, having fun, being able to speak your mind, but also having a sense of professionalism. If a seller has terms of service and then you don't even read them and then you give them crap because they don't want to take a payment plan on a $100 gecko, when their terms clearly says they'll take payment plans of 500 or over and you start hitting on them, that's when things begin to become unprofessional or when even the buyer shames the sellers, right? So um, yeah, have fun, be engaged, but don't get too crazy with your personal stuff. Don't get too crazy with being so business minded that you just are so out of touch and unrelated. There is a good middle ground that we should stay in and uh, try to find that middle ground. Thank you, Mike. Heirloom Geckos for your thoughts. Mike, again, make negative posts about other breeders without dealing with it one on one with them. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, if you have some negative stuff with some other breeders, don't talk shit behind their back publicly, but just talk with them directly, DM them, try to work it out, see what's up. You know, if things escalate, then you can try to figure out what that might look like. But just be mindful. I think the the whole idea and the thought and the goal is just to be mindful with how you talk with people, how you present things in public, right? People are watching. You are essentially a role model for people, new breeders that are up and coming, and they see your habits, and you'll either gain the respect or not. If you want to operate just kind of with no intention and say this is just who I am uh, with no thought or care about what other people think then I think that's not the best way forward again this is my opinion I'm just trying to give my thoughts about you know trying to grow your community and presence where people res will respect and hear you and listen to you be mindful of your public persona and perception doesn't mean you can't be yourself but be a little professional. Mike again says what not to do, spamming with giveaways, following a bunch of people, then dropping them to get followers. Um, yeah, I talked about giveaways and the spamminess of that in past vlogs recently. Um, and I said, that's just not my cup of tea. I don't like big spammy giveaways where everyone has to follow all these breeders and then they have to post up repost on their stories or post and then you know a bunch of people do that and you get all their spam post i'm not a fan of that uh, if people do that and it's helpful for their accounts then i'm not opposed to it but i'm not a fan of it i don't prefer it when it comes to when mike says following a bunch of people then dropping them to get followers yeah i think that kind of sucks in the beginning when i was building out my socials my instagram I would follow people, um, follow for follow essentially, right? So I followed a bunch of people and then they followed me back and then you'd, I'd always notice that some people would unfollow me, which again is fine. Like I don't take things personally, but what Mike is getting at is that a lot of people do this. They follow 5,000 accounts, 3,000 people will follow them and then they take the time, whether with apps or bots or whatever, to unfollow a bunch of people. I think... Instagram has some sort of algorithm where you can't mass unfollow people. So, cause people use bots, right? You can't mass unfollow people 
there's some sort of number and some sort of time that you can do this. And so if you spam follows or spam unfollows, then I think Instagram tags you for that. I could be wrong, but, but I think that is something that Instagram does. But yeah, I think that kind of sucks. My account Zeros Geckos, I have to turn it down this way a little bit, has, I don't know if you guys can see, has a little over 5,000 followers. 52, I can't read backwards, 5234. 5254 um, followers and I follow 990. I've never followed people in mass and then unfollowed them just to gain the followers. Once my account started growing a little bit more, I started putting out content, then people would follow me naturally. So a lot of this was a grind. It was a grind to get 5,000 followers piece by piece, you know, little by little. With certain posts and certain reels that hit a little bit, I gained a decent amount of followers relative to some other breeders. But this was a grind to get to this number. Don't think I did any sponsors. I might have used the Facebook or Instagram like free credit one time um, early on in my first year. But other than that, I never did any sponsors. Obviously, I think it does help that I have the Gecopod. Um, the podcast that I built out with AJ. Now with the vlogs, I I get some followers there. But, but yeah, I think that is more of a problem when you are first when you first start your account and you first come into the hobby um, in the socials and you join the community. You'll get a lot of followers and then they're gonna unfollow you and it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I know that's frustrating. But just hang tight. Just keep posting. Keep consistency with engaging with people in their comments. How I get to know people actually is when I post something and then they comment and then I recognize their name. Every time they comment, I recognize their name. Um, every time somebody messages me on um, in DMs and we start chatting, then I recognize their name. I think that is the way to move forward in getting yourself known in the hobby. So whether or not they follow you, it's more about people seeing and recognizing your name. The consistency of your post will help. So people that comment on my YouTube vlogs or the Gecko Pod in the YouTube comments, people that are on the lives, people that are in my DMs, more consistent people are with that stuff, with posting and engaging the more I recognize their name. That's just the natural order of things. So do that with other breeders. Don't annoy them. At bare minimum, post in the comments. Comment in people's stuff and they're gonna recognize you, they're gonna know you. Whether or not they like you, that's something different. That is up to you and your personality and how you engage and whether you're stirring up drama or whether you're there to just genuinely like appreciate their content or ask them questions. So, but yeah, that's a bit of a tangent. Uh, Mike at Heirloom Gecko says, don't follow just to um, just to drop them <laughs> so that your numbers and your ratios can look like uh, some of ours looks like. AJ follows a lot more people than I do. Um, I just, for me, how I kind of look at it is that I kind of comb through the people that I follow. And if people are inactive for like six months or, you know, they were active for a little while and then they dropped off then you know if there's dormant for six months then i'll unfollow i want to follow people that are more engaged that put out decent content and obviously i haven't gone through everybody's page yet that follows me um, but this is where it's important i feel like to comment on other breeders post whether it's chase at zengex or gabby at morph menagerie or flawless at um flawless cursed geckos will and audra um if you want to engage with a certain breeder, keep commenting in their post. Keep liking their stuff. The more you do that, I'm not just talking about like a week or two. I'm talking about consistently. Not just so that you can boost up their ego and lift up their socials. The point is, is that you want to make that connection. You want to develop, develop that relationship and consistency with a certain breeder is going to give you more face time and the best way to do that is in their comments. DM is one way to do it, but you can overdo it and you know, breeders can be annoyed of you too. I'm not, I'm not just talking about myself. I'm talking about just in general, etiquette of the DMs and messaging people. Most big breeders aren't going to give you the time of day, by the way. I, I noticed this, you know, I'll message people 
here and there, you know, back in the day, and they'll give you one or two sentence replies. And I've done this too, by the way, so I'm, I'm guilty as well. Consistency with talking with them in a way that is engaging to them might be helpful. That's not free reign, by the way, to just annoy your favorite breeders, but uh, mindfulness, mindfulness. The bu public comments in their post are the best and probably the easiest way to for them to kind of see you and uh, and know you. Heirloom geckos again, Mike, you're killing it, man. <laughs> you got so many thoughts here. Uh, what not to do. Not sharing others' breeders when you post animals you got from them. Give them credit. Okay, so I have some thoughts about this. I agree to a certain point. I think that when you get an animal from somebody that you love, you should post it up and give the breeder you got from credit. However, if you don't, and this is more of a, this isn't a black and white issue, by the way. This is more of like, it's not bad, but maybe you should type of thing. But if you don't, it is fair game. The animal is now in your possession. You bought it fair and square. It's your animal. You can do whatever you want with it. Now, is it nice to give credit to the person that you bought it from? Yeah, it's nice. But the seller, the breeder that sold it to you shouldn't get salty if you don't do that. That's my take and that's kind of how I see it. So early on, I would post up geckos and I'd always tag um, the person that I bought it from, but I wouldn't get a thanks. I wouldn't get a reshare and no acknowledgement. So should I have reshared it? Does it matter that they wanted credit? Maybe the person didn't even care and they didn't want credit for it. And so if they don't thank me for it, if they don't uh, care to share it back out or even like the post at the very least or say thank you at the very least, it doesn't matter. Should you not do it? I, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I'm just saying that some people don't mind as much. If I sell you an animal and you share it and you tag me, man, I'm thankful. I'll reshare it. I'll message you and thank you, things like that. But ultimately, if you don't tag me, I'm not gonna be salty about it because you bought the animal, it's yours, you can do whatever you want with it. But that's my take, Mike. Oh shoot, I gotta go soon. I'll have to come back and, and finish up a handful more of these, but let me see. Let me do one more. <laughs> and again, this one's from Mike, Heirloom Geckos. Not being friendly to other breeders. Yeah, I mean, that's just uh, etiquette and being a nice human in the community, being friendly to each other. You know, some people are more introverted and quiet and if they kind of ignore you, like, don't take offense to that. If they're mean to you, obviously, you could take offense to that and you can call that out. But I think in general, there are a lot of introverts in this hobby and a lot of people that are shy and a lot of people that just want to keep to themselves. There are a couple very well-known breeders that pretty much everyone in the gecko hobby knows um, that I've met a couple times and I've tried to chat with this person, didn't know who I was or pretended they didn't know when clearly I've met them before and I've talked with them before. And I try not to take offense to that because I just figure like, okay, maybe they're bad with names, they're bad with, they're not very involved in the community. And um, I try not to take offense to that. So were they nice to me? They weren't not nice, but they weren't like friendly or weren't very welcoming and warm. I guess you can't expect that from every single breeder. Most breeders are not gonna be very warm and welcoming to, to you. Some will be just nice and they'll chat with you. And there's a lot of good breeders that will, are just very friendly. But there are a good handful also that are just kind of indifferent about everything. And so they're not mean, but they're just whatever. So those type of people, I appreciate their work, but they're not people that I would necessarily do business with. I tend to keep company with people that will at least try to be nicer to people and try to be involved in the community and try to lift up new breeders and things like that. But yes, I agree. Don't be mean to other breeders. Okay. I'll be back more after I have to run this errand and take care of this thing. It might be darker, but I'll be back. Hey guys, I'm back. Yesterday was pretty busy. After I stopped recording, had to get the kids. My wife's out of town, so I couldn't finish uploading and recording in time to put it out today, but it's okay. I put out a podcast. Um, AG and I put out a Gecko Pod podcast out today. It's about Morph Market, and we are just browsing Morph Market, building experimental projects and the thought process that we go through when picking out and choosing some animals. So hopefully that was a good episode for you guys to kind of learn and grow from, especially if you're a new breeder. I feel like that would be a helpful 
thing to watch to kind of see how AJ or I pick and choose animals, the pricing, and kind of laying out all the variables that we consider and think about when picking an animal. I'm here in my car, thought I'd switch it up a little bit. It's kind of a cloudy overcast day in California. We're about to have a storm front roll in, but it's nice right now, it's kind of calm. You can see those clouds rolling in. It's supposed to be raining today and tomorrow into the weekend. So anyway, getting back to some of the questions of what not to do. Sea glass geckos says, don't house babies in bioactive. I don't have enough experience to speak on that because most of my stuff is not bioactive. I have maybe four tanks that are, that are semi bioactive. I have reptosoil in there. I did have isopods before, a little bit of springtails, but I think those died off. But I don't have live plants. I have UVB on a couple of them. But other than that, I, but I only have housed adults in those. I've never housed babies in those. Babies, I've just always done hatchling uh, bins, six quart shoe bins, whether it's the target sterilite ones or else after I got racks, then I put them in the container store. Uh, six quart bins i drilled a two and a half inch vent uh, hole in the bin and then i bought some round vents to kind of uh, mesh round vents to cover the hole so there's good ventilation i haven't even considered or thought about putting babies in bioactive whether it's wrong or not i don't have experience with that or know too much about that and so i don't want to speak negatively about it if other people do it so i just i just don't know Jazz Zion from Japan. What's up, man? Good to hear from you. Um, what not to do. Learn to do Learn to do basic research before asking a question on Facebook, like adult gecko sexing. Um, yeah, I think, I think, I, I know what you're saying. I think it's an, uh, it can be annoying if you people just ask repeatedly the same questions again and again and not doing the actual research and work themselves when they could easily just look it up. But depending on kind of the culture and the vibe of the forum, like whether it's Facebook or whatever um, channel, like we have our Gecopod Discord where people just ask the same questions over and over and that's fine because uh, it's made for that. So I, I would say that it depends on the vibe and the culture of the people running those groups or who are in those groups. If they're kind of snotty and you ask them a basic question and they're like, go check this, they're like, okay, uh, then yeah, obviously don't do that. Don't ask basic questions there. But there are other forums that are safe enough for you guys to ask basic questions over and over again. Uh, Gekobot Discord, feel free to ask basic questions and we'll do our best to direct you to either an episode that talks about that or you know, members within the community will also try to help out at times as well but if you dm me and you ask me basic questions i'll do my best to answer some of those basic questions if i don't have time to answer it line by line i'll try to pull up the episode on the gecko pod or wherever that information is found and i'll just link you so you can quickly find it but yeah if you can do your research first do your best to dig around a little bit at least don't be lazy about it if you are doing your research and you maybe missed it um, you can just ask and most people are pretty cool about talking to you and helping you out. Alexander German, what's up Alex? Alex says, do not pack with hand warmers. Yes, don't pack your box with hand warmers. The hand warmer packs spike up to a higher temp, which is not good. Hand warmer temps spike higher, but the half-life of how the heat um, disperses is much shorter. Instead, you want a, a moderate temp rise that lasts longer. Let me look up how long or how hot a hand warmer lasts. Hey Siri, how hot do hand warmers get? Siri says, hand warmers can reach up to 130 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty hot. The 40 hour heat packs that I use and a lot of people use that you can buy from reptiles to you or Redline Shipping or Uline or wherever, TSK, TSK supplies, all those um, suppliers, I believe they have a 40 hour option. The go-to is the 40 hour pack that only gets to 100 degrees. Hey Siri, how long do hand warmers last? So it says once activated, hand warmers can last between seven and 24 hours depending on the brand and the quality of the materials inside. 
So let's say a hand warmer spikes up to 130 degrees Fahrenheit and lasts 7 to 24 hours. That's all bad, right? If your package gets delayed and your hand warmer spikes to 130 for 7 hours, then it fizzles out before it even reaches the sorting facility and it could be sitting there in cold temps for a long time. So yes, don't use hand warmers. Not a good idea. Thanks, Alex. Colin at Middle Tennessee Cuberis, he says, don't be overly defensive when people have questions. Okay, that's true. And talk to customers like they homies. Um, yeah, I think customer service, being able to relate to your customers and not make it seem like it's a chore to talk to them. I feel like most big breeders will talk to you like it's a business rather than you're their friend. And uh, I think it's just because of the amount of messages they get, perhaps. I'm not sure. I get a decent amount of messages, but it's not a ton, ton, you know? Like, so, and, and I feel like I have enough time to message everybody and be friendly with everybody. And also, I think I just like talking to people. So some breeders are very introverted and don't want to talk to people and answer the same questions again and again, but I don't mind it. I kind of enjoy building those relationships and um, having conversations because people are just curious and they want to learn and grow. Now, there are some people that will message you and waste your time and you'll give them tips, you'll give them suggestions and they do exactly the opposite. Those people kind of annoy me <laughs> because why are you even asking me questions if you're not going to listen to anything I'm going to say? Why are you asking me for advice when I tell you one thing and then you do the exact complete opposite you can get advice somewhere else then it's fine um, and again it's not like you have to listen to everything i say but if our entire conversation revolves around me explaining to you certain things and aspects that and foresight that you have not yet experienced and i'm trying to help you and give you some of those tips and you still do something completely opposite then i'm like okay like that's fine you don't have to listen to me but if we're spending like weeks t chatting and this happens, then I'm like, okay, like maybe you just found another person that is teaching you and just go talk to them and that's fine. You don't have to listen to me. I'm, I'm not gonna be overly defensive about it, like you said, um, Colin, but I think it's a matter of respecting other people's time. Now, some people are too cautious about talking to me or big breeders. Like you don't have to apologize every time you're messaging me like I enjoy talking to people so you don't have to apologize just um, yeah just enjoy each other's company and presence and have a good conversation and so uh, most people are really cool and chill so I don't so in general I, I just like talking to you guys so feel free to message me thanks for that comment Colin Valer Geckos says don't uh, what not to do don't place judgment to people without much research on accuracy Okay, don't place, don't judge people without research on much accuracy. So I'm guessing that, Valer, um, you're talking about don't judge people from a superficial level without truly understanding the nitty gritty of why they're saying things they're saying or why they're doing the things that they're doing. And yeah, I think that's true. It's easy for us to kind of shame each other and throw people under the bus without much research of what they're doing, why they're doing it, knowing their backstory and things like that. I agree with that. I think that's pretty fair. You know, some people have, you know, talked bad about me or AJ before about our six quart um, bins in racks, thinking that we're pulling adults out of those things without asking us directly. And that kind of sucks. You know, you kind of hear things on the back end and from other people that have heard and if you have an issue with somebody and it bothers you, like go talk to them and figure things out and ask detailed questions, not to judge, not to shame people, but because you're learning and also because maybe you're trying to help them learn as well. Another good example is sometimes seeing new breeders build up their collection and their how you know, they show rooms of their housing and how they keep things and you know, experienced breeders will see it and be like, oh, "Okay, like they need they're missing this piece they're missing a vent they're missing some vents here or 
or their diet. Their diet is way too watery. They can thicken it. I think you don't have to judge them, but people are just learning. So if we see that all of us are still just trying to learn and evolve our care and our breeding practices, then it's less of a like you suck type of feeling and vibe and more of like uh, asking questions and probing and being like, hey, have you ever tried this? Um, do you think this would help? I've tried it this way for several years. I've done, I've made all these mistakes and this is what's worked for me. And then you present that information and they can take it or not. And if they don't take that information, then, you know, they just don't, you don't have that connection with them and you can just move on. If you're going to harshly critique people publicly, you better first talk to them directly in DMs face to face before you, you know, bring it up to other people with a genuine concern. If there are a lot of minor details that don't really matter, then just don't have them in your circles. Don't hang out with them. Don't associate with them if you don't want. But in general, there's just way too much. I know more than you. You guys suck, you know, and it, and it sucks. Like nobody wants to learn like that. I'm not going to listen to anybody that comes off aggressive like that saying like, oh, I know better than you. You know, some people can come in and say like, well, I've been breeding reptiles for 20 years. I know better than you. And I'd be like, yeah, you have five crested geckos for the last two years. Like our practices in terms of keeping and care, it's going to vary a little bit, you know? Keep your comments to yourself if it's not going to be productive and you're just there to critique in a way that's not helpful. Right? There's a way to critique in a way that's helpful and there's a way to critique um, with less tact and kind of cocky and gross where nobody's going to listen to you. So, okay, looks like we're coming more towards the end here. Um, Noah with a few few more. Noah says, Oklahoma Zoological, don't buy a mountain of wholesale stock to breed when you're starting out. Okay, yes, in general, I agree with that. I do think that a lot of breeders, even some successful breeders, have built their stock initially from wholesale. AC Wholesale, Reptiles by Mac Wholesale, mainly AC Wholesale. <laughs> AC is one of the bigger breeders that has supplied a lot of people with animals. If that's you, and I know there are many people that have done that, don't feel bad, that's fine. I think what Noah is trying to say, which I align with because this is how I wanna build out my collection, is that I don't want to build my collection from animals that are not the best. And so again, we can have a different business model and a different way to navigate the hobby if you're just more of a show person, just, want, just wants to breed uh, pet quality or low to mid tier quality um, for the shows and for people that are um, pet keepers, that's fine. That Just run your business, don't worry about it. But I do think that the Crested Gecko market is pretty saturated because a lot of people have been breeding wholesale animals and selling them on the cheap. And, and in turn, other people use those animals to keep breeding wholesale animals into themselves. And the um, flood and the saturation of low tier animals is pretty high. So I think that's what Noah is getting at. How I built my um, collection, and again, I say this not in a way that I'm better than you, but just in the direction that I want to take it. And also with the mindset that I want to improve quality in the overall hobby is that I pick and chose each and every single animal that I bought out from the beginning. I didn't wholesale pack anything. I have zero wholesale animal packs that I bought. Now, did some of my animals that I spent a lot of money on turn out to look wholesale? I have a handful of those and those hurt. My intention was to buy the best animals as best as I can and pair those together to make better animals. And like I've said before, even when you pair two amazing animals, you're still going to get some low to mid tier type of animals. And I've seen that in the last two seasons, which has happened. I paired some pretty nice animals and still got low to mid tier animals. Not everything's going to be amazing. So just be prepared for that. But even the lower quality animals that you produce from amazing breeders, it's still nicer than the wholesale animals that we see at shows. So the overall quality of the stock that gets dumped into the hobby is a little bit higher. So I agree that to the best of your ability, if you're breeding for quality, then buy, pick and choose 
animals individually in the beginning and just buy the best stuff. We see too many breeders on Instagram that says high-end crested geckos. You look at their stuff, that's not high-end stuff. It's low to mid-tier stuff. Um, high-end comes when you are willing to spend the time and energy to research and look through everybody's animals and you begin to see what quality really is. To some degree, there is a bit of subjectivity to quality, but in general, you can tell what's a very nice animal and what is a wholesale animal. It's very obvious. So to you new breeders, if you are on a budget, then be wise with that budget. Again, spend your thousand bucks, your two thousand bucks on two of the best breeders that you can buy, just two animals, and just breed that pair. To me, it wouldn't make sense if you're breeding for quality to buy any sort of mystery pack. Don't buy the mystery packs if that is your initial stock to go off of that you wanna breed. The mystery packs oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes are people that can't get rid of their low tear and their wholesale level animals and so they just dump it into a mystery pack so that you can't see them <laughs> and you'll buy them. Now, there are some exceptions to this. Some breeders have nice animals. Even when they breed two amazing animals, they'll still get lower tier stuff and yet that lower tier stuff is still better than a lot of people's mid to high end, you know, mid to high end stock that they're producing from their wholesale packs. In that sense, a mystery pack from some top people might not be a bad idea but if you're a serious breeder that wants to breed top stock don't buy mystery packs with that said i'm not against mystery packs i might even put out some mystery packs again it depends on your budget and how much time and energy you want to take in going through every single top breeders page and asking them questions and picking out holdbacks that they haven't listed yet that takes a very long time. That's what I did for a year, a year and a half when I first came in. And so, so it, takes long, it takes a long time and it is long road and it's very expensive. That's not for everybody. So again, know yourself, know what your budget is, know how much you wanna dive into the hobby and um, adjust accordingly. The TLDR, mystery packs are fine. Don't freak out if you're buying them. Don't freak out if you're selling them. Um, don't freak out if you still like them but just know that the quality isn't going to be as nice as those that you're picking and choosing holdbacks from and spending top dollar on. Just something to be mindful. But thank you for Noah for that one. Okay, two more from Noah. I think quarantine should probably be a bigger emphasis than the Cresty Hobby makes it. Um, I had to ask Noah his take on this because we talked a little bit about quarantining and biosecurity on the gecko pod several episodes back but it wasn't a heavy conversation or a deep conversation but noah's point is that with snakes there are times where people's entire collection gets wiped out from crypto or nido and for cresties i haven't seen that yet i haven't heard about it yet but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist and so noah was telling me that you know, it's possible that some people have left the hobby quietly because they lost their entire collection from diseases because they didn't properly quarantine. They brought in an animal that was sick and it kind of spread to the entire collection and colony and all their breeders and it kind of wiped out their facility, you know, their facility of animals. Now, to be fair, I ask, OK, who are these people? Because I haven't heard of that. And um, he didn't name anybody, but. Noah's been in the hobby much longer than I have, so I'm going to trust that that has happened before. Now, to the degree that that has happened, I'm not sure. Uh, Percentage-wise, from breeders, number of breeders, to how many people that has affected, I, I don't know those numbers, so I can't speak too heavily on it. But I have personally, and I've talked to a lot of people, I have personally not heard too much about Cresties, um, falling ill to a lot of um, diseases. Nonetheless, all of us still quarantine. The practice of quarantining is important. Anytime you get animals from shows, try to keep them separated from all your other stuff when you're bringing them home. And then when you come home, you can keep them in a different room. You can, if you want to risk it, you can keep them 
in maybe the same room, but away, far away, opposite side of the room from everything else. If your room is small and packed together, then um, it's probably better to keep things separate. Just find another room to house them in for a month or so. Quarantining is important. A tip that AJ told me a while ago was that, you know, anytime you buy animals from people and they ship it to you, one thing to do is to toss the deli cups. Like, don't reuse it. You can obviously scrub the deli cup down, um, put it in disinfectant and soak it and, and it will kill germs. But AJ's like, don't even worry about it. Just the deli cups are so cheap anyway. It's like a dollar, two dollars. Uh, just toss the deli cup that it comes in and then quarantine your animal separate from the rest of your collection. And um, that's the safe way to go. So yeah, Noah is saying that the Krusty Hobby doesn't talk much about the ill effects of not quarantining and possibly running the risk of um, catching parasites and other unwanted things to wreck your collection. And I would say that I agree. We can talk more about it for sure. I'm still learning, so hopefully I'll have more conversations moving forward about it. Okay, last one. Noah says, um, oh, this is what not to do. Overextending yourself, whether as a new or seasoned breeder. Yes, basically talking about how to balance our time and energy. I'm a little bit older and I've gone through um, a few jobs where I've worked a lot. I feel like I don't have very good boundaries when it comes to work. Part of it is because I'm not disciplined with the efficiency of how I use my time and energy, but I will use my time and energy. I have a high drive to work and be productive and to find ways to create things and build things. So I spend a lot of time, more time than I should on any given task. My wife, on the other hand, she's much smarter than I am. <laughs> she's, an, she's an engineer and she's very efficient with kind of how she does things with her time and her productivity. And she always just kind of rolls her eyes anytime I do things because I'll do the task, but it's going to take me more than double the time that it takes her. I absolutely agree with this, Noah. Overworking yourself to death is not good. You know, a lot of times we'll do things because we're trying to work for a paycheck and that's honorable and it's good that you're trying to provide for your family and to kind of build a lifestyle that you want, you know, working hard to get promoted and to improve your life and the fa life of your family. That's not a bad thing to enjoy a vacation. I think these are all good things. I think these are all things that we want and we all work for. But yeah, I'm no stranger to overworking. For long stretches of time, for many seasons, I've worked countless hours, maybe 60 hours a week, sometimes 80 hours a week. And um, I would take shifts where it's back to back to back to back. And those are not good things to do. It just kills your health. Um, it kills your relationships. And those things are bad. <laughs> No, I know he draws a lot. He does a lot of his art and he does logos for people. And he spends so many hours doing logos, not just logos, but commission pieces that are, you know, big art pieces. And he loves it because that's his craft, but also he can get so deep into it that it begins to cause anxiety and stress and depression. And those things scientifically have a direct effect on your physical health. I've gotten you know, countless migraines from working and not sleeping. I've broken out in crazy eczema. I've had alopecia, a lot of autoimmune stuff. In general, I'm a pretty healthy guy, but when I'm stressed to that level, it's not good. I get like crazy depressed too when I'm overworked and not sleeping well. And I'm just in just this pit for seasons and I can't snap out of it emotionally. It's just not good. It messes with not just your physical health, your emotional health, your spiritual health. It messes with your family, your relationships with friends and family, and it's all bad. So don't kill yourself. Don't overwork yourself. Work hard, yes, but don't, but not to the detriment of your health. I said this in the last vlog though. I do think a lot of people are lazy. I think a lot of people don't work hard enough 
So there is a balance, guys. Try to find that balance. Don't work 80 hours a week. That's not good. But don't work 10 hours a week and think you're going to be successful. It doesn't happen. You have to put in the time. You have to put in the energy. You have to put in that mental work to get over the hump of your laziness and just grind and do amazing things. Even sometimes when you don't feel like working, just got to get up, do your job, get to work. Work ethic is huge in business. Having a good work ethic is huge in success. Be successful in life, you just have to be disciplined and have a good work ethic. If you're successful without those things, that's called luck. Most of us don't have luck. We have to pave our own way. We have to pay our dues. We have to work hard and grind. And a lot of times, unfortunately, you're going to hate part of the process of getting there. It is a grind to work hard. Good balance is having a strong work ethic, but also finding a lot of time to rest and to slow down just to be with not just yourself, but with those that are important to you. Relationships are important. And you don't want to kill those relationships as you go through life. But yep, work hard, do good things, but don't overextend yourself. Thank you guys for those responses and your thoughts on those. Really appreciate you guys. I'll keep trying to think of different topics that I can ask and poll. It's more engaging rather than me just coming up with stuff, which I don't mind. I, can, I have plenty of stuff I can talk about and come up with, which I will still do. But I'll try to mix that in with um, you know, responses from you guys. And in that way, I feel like it's more fun so that we can basically have a conversation together. But thank you guys for listening. Is there anything else we got to talk about? I still have some topics that I have that I didn't get to today, but I will keep it for the next one. If you guys haven't already, you can subscribe to my channel, like this video, send in comments, send in comments below, or you can DM me whatever is easiest. You can go to zerosgeckos.com. I'm still planning to post up some availability, but I've been really slacking on that. I do put up my auction animals. I haven't been as consistent last week, but I'm gonna to try to keep them coming at least one auction a week. The prices aren't the best for me. It's good for you guys, because you guys are getting animals for a steal of prices, in my opinion. But again, it's fine because you guys are getting, hopefully, pretty good animals for discounted prices and it also kind of directs people towards my page. I'm trying to build out more traffic to it so that when I have more availability and other things to talk about, then people can naturally just go there and they'll see stuff. I also want to build out my mailing list. Um, you can sign up for my mailing list as well. Just go to my website, go to the bottom and subscribe or something. I'll probably post up some availability, some upcoming stuff and um, stuff like you know the gecko pod or the vlog or animals that i think are cool and it'll just be another source of information sent to your email but thank you guys appreciate you all i'll see you guys on the next one